Texas. He didn't believe in slavery. He went to jail for it. Dr. King, Martin Luther King, did not believe in the laws of segregation. He disobeyed them and he went to jail over it. In an attempt, we'll talk about this later in the semester, to raise the consciousness of the people that these laws violate what he calls the law of God. They're not good laws. They need to be changed. And so we have changed those periodically throughout history. Okay. So we live in a system where we're regulated by law, but the law can't be so written in stone that when we get the law wrong, we can't change it. Well, that creates a problem for Kant, because Kant says reason operates, you may see this on your exam, in an a priori fashion. That means before you reach a conclusion, reason is working. Kant thinks that reason works in such a way that if we all use reason the right way, we all come to the same conclusion. It's just reasonable. No lying, stealing, cheating, raping, robbing. Well, okay, fine, but wait a minute. We're just a few weeks away from talking about ethical issues. What if we don't all agree with abortion? We're reasonable, we've sat down, we've thought it out, and we come to this conclusion, you come to that. We're gonna to come to capital punishment, and some people are all for, hang them! And other people say, well, that's about as barbaric as we can be. I thought we've gone past, well, wait a minute, I thought we're all reasonable people, but we may not all agree. We're gonna to come to embryonic stem cell research. We're gonna talk about euthanasia, mercy killing. We're gonna talk about social justice and welfare and capitalism. I guarantee you we're not all going to agree. Well, wait a minute, we're all reasonable people, aren't we? Well, see, Kant, you better say yes. The fact that we don't agree doesn't make us unreasonable. But Kant, in order to make his theory work, said, no, if you use reason the right way, it's conditioned to have to come to the same conclusion. And that's just not true, people. Now, we can be reasonable and maybe come to compromises that we can all live with. And we do use Kant's theory on a regular basis. That's where our rules come from. You drive on the road, you come to class, you don't cheat in class when you take tests, no open book, open note online. <laughs> I'm sorry, I said laughing. <laughs> but it's not the only rule that we use. We use deontological ethics, Aristotle's right. We're teleologists by nature. Everything we do has a purpose in mind. We're trying to achieve our purposes, our ends. Hedonism's right. People would rather have more pleasure rather than less, less pain rather than more. Social contract theory, if you're in my justice class, we already have a conversation in there. Some people think, people, some theorists think people are bad and that's why we need a heavy-handed government and some people think the government's bad and that's why we need a limited government. We don't agree on that. Thomas Hobbes, Jean <coughs> Rousseau. We're going to get to a point where we talk about virtue ethics and feminist ethics in this class as well. So the point of this is as we develop the rules of social engagement, we can't rely on just one theory. No one size fits everything. But this does fit pretty well, and we use it on a regular basis, just like hedonism does, the principle of utility, the greatest happiness, greatest number. Aristotle's right about teleological ethics. We're all purpose-driven. Any questions about that? Okay, now I have a few more minutes with you. So this is up here to just help you as a study guide. This is Immanuel Kant, the goodwill and the categorical imperative. The goodwill, the only thing valuable without limitation in all circumstances. This is a steady disposition to act from duty, to understand that when you will to do something, it's your duty to follow through. Acting from duty is not the same as acting in accordance with duty. Doing one's duty for the sake of doing one's duty, not in order to serve one's desires. So you're compelled to do what you know is right for the right reason all the time. Now, what was the downside of that I shared with you, I think, in this class? No lying. And the Nazis come to my door and want to know if I have 20 Jewish people in my basement. What do I do? Well, I lie. 
I make sanctity of life, in this case, very limited exception, more important than no lying. But no lying is the law. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And if you don't, it's perjury and you'll go to jail. In some situations, like Annapolis and West Point and the Air Force Academy, if you see someone cheat and you don't turn them in and they find out you cheat, you both are expelled and you never get back in again. It's called code and honor and duty. What would life be like if we lived by duty all the time? There are some institutions that employ that and some don't. So you do the right thing for the right reason, in theory, all the time, but there may be, you might have to make some exceptions to the rule. We may have another one of the theories that come into play. Only actions done from duty, therefore, have moral worth. Categorical imperative is a requirement of reason, not emotions, binding completely independent of one's desires. So the categorical imperative is not about what you desire, it's about duty. It's about what reason tells us is the thing that we should do. Contrast it to hypothetical imperatives. So there's really three formulations. This is two and I'll mention the third one. Formulation number one, how do you form one of these categorical imperatives? Number one, universal law formulation. Act only in accordance with the maxim. Maxim is a philosophical word for law. So when you see maxim, if you see it on your quiz, that means law. <coughs> Act only in accordance with that maxim through which you can at the same time will that it becomes a universal law. So in Kant's world, if you're going to make a law, it has to apply to everybody. You can't make individual laws like disability laws. It has to apply to everybody. So equal work for equal pay. It takes gender out of the way, it takes ethnicity out of the way, it takes everything out of the way. You work hard, you're qualified, you should get the reward for it. We'll get to that at the end of the semester. It's called meritocracy. You should get the fruit of your own labor without discrimination. It's universal. It applies to everybody. We have laws originally in this country, a little while ago, were anti-age discrimination laws, and they were meant to protect older people. Oh, you're too old, we just put you out to pasture. You all need a law, an anti-age discrimination, to protect you as young people. You go to get a job, and one of the things your employer wants to know is how much experience you have. None. That's why I'm applying for a job. How am I get experience if I don't work? Well, we're only looking for people who are experienced. You see, your employer is not interested in paying you to work. Your employer is interested in paying you to make your employer even more money. So if you go to work and don't produce, they can find someone who can. I, did I talk about my, my time in Publix? Do I have people here work in Publix? I made, I made an application online. I get a call from a guy named Mike. Mike's a district uh, manager. It was the Publix just closed over on, uh, on 19 and 52. So I go in and, you know, dressed up, you know, hi, Mike, and, you know, sit down. And he says, I have one question. This is my interview. I have one question. He says, 17 years without a day off? That's what I put on my application. And I said, where I come from, if you don't work, you don't eat. I said, now some days when I was not feeling real well, I had to isolate myself so I didn't get you sick. And some days I brought my B game because that's the best I could do. And some days I even brought my C game. But I always gave you my best, whatever I was at. But most of the time it was my A game. No, I never took a day off in 17 years. The next thing he asked me, he says, how much do you think my assistant managers make? I said, I don't know. He said, guess. I said, 50 grand a year. He says, 60. He says, I'm going to put you in the deli department for six months. I can't promote you right away, but after six months, I want you to be one of my assistant managers. Do not work in the deli department. You work in the deli? Nobody wants to work in the deli department. <laughs> Nobody. Oh, yeah, you lose your finger. See that? No. <laughs> Trust me. I was there one day, and that, that hook to hold the meat in place right through my thumb. Yeah. So the point of that is then they're looking for experience out there. In fact, when you graduate and you go to an employer and they're going to say, well, what can you do? And you show them your, your piece of paper and they're going to say, well, let me see you do what that paper says you can do. And if you can't do that, you know what they're going to say? Next. Next. Because there's five people for every good paying job in this country right now. What if I don't have any experience? I can do that, but he 
they're probably going to want someone with more experience. You see, experienced people sometimes don't have to be managed. They can just let them say, hey, I, I want you to do this, I'm going to go do that, and you can just go, go do your job. I, I was studying, I had a computer business for 16 years, I've ever mentioned that in here, and I was, uh, I was uh, at school, back at school to get what they call a CCNA, a Cisco Certified Network Analyst. Immediate 60,000 bucks once you get this. Cisco makes the hardware, or made the hardware for 90% of the worldwide internet. Very lucrative. So one of the things we did after theory is we had to set up a network, but instead of going, you know, all over the world, you just set it up. You can set it up in a classroom so it works right. And so they put five of us together. And uh, they said, you know, you have an hour or whatever. And, you know, we just kind of looked at one another for about three minutes. And I said, I had a military kid there. And I said, you did wire in the military, right? And he says, yeah. I said, why don't you run the wire for us? And why don't you do this and that? And the military kid looked at me and he goes, do you own a business? And I said, yeah, why? And he says, because you like to tell people what to do. And I said, well, I don't have to be doing that. He says, no, I'm glad we have someone who knows how to do business. We need someone to organize us, right? And that guy went and laid wire. I didn't worry about it. That one did that. The woman did. Everybody did their job. And before you know it, we had a network up. You all need protection in the marketplace, people. They're not openly discriminated against you, but they are discriminating against you. And Kant says that's not fair. All law must be universally applied the same everywhere. So that's his first maxim. Number two, humanity formulation. Act that you use humanity, whether in your own person or another, always at the same time as an end and never as a means only. In other words, we enter into agreements. You agree to get it? I agree to get it. Whatever we agree to get, we're going to respect each other, and we're going to give each other what your, what your expectations are, what the agreement says we're going to give one another. So you want to A for the course? And I said, fine. Well, my, my agreement will be to hopefully teach you everything you need to get A, and your agreement will be keep it. And at the end of the semester, if you've kept it, you get an A. No questions asked. Whether it's 90 or whether it's 104, you're going to get an A. And the last one is respecting the fact that we all have the capacity to make law. I can't say, well, you know, you don't have enough education, or you don't have enough this, or you're female this. Or, no, 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 no. We all have a capacity to make law because we all have the capacity to reason. We all have the capacity to put our will on the line and make it our duty to follow through, whether it's hypothetical or categorical imperative. And as long as we follow that formulation, as far as Kant's concerned, we're lawmakers. And we can enter into a social agreement that makes the rules that govern our behavior and also protect us as long as we follow the rules. Simple enough? There's an upside and a downside. Aristotle's up, uh, upside, reason again, it's reasonable. Downside, I'm not avoiding my feelings. <laughs> They're integral to who I am as a person. I can't disassociate myself from Kant, once again, reason, real important. What happens when we don't agree? Well, we're in a social situation. Some of us are not always going to get what we want. We're going to have to learn to live together. Even though we're all rational and we reason, we may not always agree. So questions for me, people, before I let you go? None? Everybody's cool? Try and take your quiz the way I suggested. If you do that, I think you'd do better. It's, it's